great, great blessing. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to be here again today. We come anticipating your will, your voice. We pray that as we open your word, we might hear you speak to us. And that our service today will be something that will leave a deep impression upon our hearts, a transforming effect that we might leave this place inspired to share your message of hope with others. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. The great preacher Billy Graham, I'm sure probably most of us here have heard of Billy Graham. In one of his sermons, he tells the fascinating story about the brilliant scientist Albert Einstein. It seems that uh, one day, Einstein was traveling on a train throughout Europe, and uh, as the steward was coming down the center aisle to collect the tickets, he noticed that Einstein could not find his ticket. He was searching in his briefcase, looking in his pockets, checking. He couldn't find it, and the steward said, don't worry, don't worry, Mr. Einstein, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are, I know that you have your ticket, I'm, I know you have it somewhere, don't worry about it, it's okay. And so the steward continued on down the center aisle, collected a few more tickets from other passengers, and then he looked back, and he saw Einstein down on his knees and hands crawling around on the floor, looking underneath his seat, looking everywhere frantically to try to find his ticket. And so he wanted, to, uh, he wanted to put him at ease, and he went over and he said, Professor Einstein, look, I know who you are. Don't worry about it. It's fine. And Einstein, on his hands and knees, looked up at the man, the steward, and he said, well, I know who I am too, but I don't know where I'm going. And uh, when I read that story, I thought, you know, that's kind of how our world is today. There are so many people in our world today that really don't know where we're going. They look at uh, the news and they see the, the turmoil in our world. They see the unrest, the unhappiness, the problems that exist uh, in our world today. And they're desperately searching for hope. But... In many cases, no matter where they search, how long they search, that hope seems to escape them. And so they don't know where they're going, but I want to tell you today, I am happy to say, and I say this humbly, Seventh-day Adventists today know where we are going. When we look at the signs and that the conditions of our world, we recognize that, that these are signs that the prophets, that Jesus and others have said would take place in our world that would indicate that the coming of Christ was drawing near. We understand as Seventh-day Adventist Christians that soon Jesus is going to come to take us to be with him. Amen. We know that all the problems and the struggles that exist in this world are not going to go on forever. We know where the answer for hope is. We know where we are going. And it becomes quite evident in the Seventh-day Adventist Church that this is so. When you stop to consider a couple facts, now it may not appear to be so here in North America, but in other parts of the world, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is experiencing explosive growth. In fact, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and again, I say this humbly, is one of the fastest-growing churches in the world today. Did you know that? We have the largest Protestant school system in the entire world. We have hospitals and clinics and medical facilities all around the globe. We have a very mission-driven church, and we have a presence as a church in more countries of this world than any other church, with the exception of the Roman Catholic Church. And they have been here a lot longer than us. Now, there's a very good reason why this has happened. Okay? There's a very good reason why 
we have made some of the advances that we have made in this world. There's a reason why we know where we are going. In order to explain the answer to that or the reason for that, I want us to go back in history just a little bit. You will know when I say this date what it refers to, at least most of you will, October 22nd, 1844. Now just two weeks ago, two weeks ago tomorrow, uh, it was the 179th anniversary of October 22nd, 1844, which, which has become known in the minds of many as the day of the great disappointment. Why the great disappointment? Well, for a number of years leading up to that date, there were individuals who were studying all around the world, by the way, were studying the prophecies of the book of Daniel, particularly Daniel's, Daniel chapters 8 and 9. And as they studied those passages, this conviction took hold of their hearts that the world was rapidly coming to an end and Jesus was soon going to come. Now, here in North America, of course, we recognize the name William Miller. And William Miller was probably the most prominent of the preachers of this message here in North America, though there were others. But it's also important to remember that there were people in other parts of the world who nev had never met Miller. And as they had studied these prophecies, they were coming to the same conclusions as well, that Jesus would return to this world sometime around 1843, 1844. And eventually, of course, we know they settled on this date uh, in October of 1844. And some people say there were tens of thousands, some even say that maybe a million or so people believed this message that Christ was coming. There was this great excitement, this great fervor, this great longing for the return of Jesus. And, you know, I, when I pastored out of New York, I had the wonderful privilege many, many times to go to William Miller's home, his farm there and to walk into the, the house where he lived and to go out to the Ascension Rock and the little chapel just through the Maple Grove. And uh, I would go into the house and there, you know, they have the bedroom with a little desk and a chair. And as I stood there and looked at that, I was reminded what Ellen White says about how William Miller would, would be there and he would be studying the Word of God and he would be praying. And as he did so, with his Bible and his Cruden's Concordance, the angels would be standing, the angel would stand over him to watch and to guide. What a wonderful thought to think that angels were watching over him as he studied. Do you suppose that as you and I study the scriptures that perhaps, just maybe, angels might be standing over our shoulders too? I think it might be so. At least I want to believe that. That's an encouraging thought. Well, William Miller studied and so many others studied and they were anticipating with great excitement that Jesus would come. But as we know, obviously Jesus did not come. They admitted that they had made a mistake, to their credit. They were wrong in the prediction of the event that took place. They were correct in their calculation of the 2300 day year prophecy, when it began and when it ended, beginning in 457 AD and ending, and ending in uh, 1844 AD. They were correct in the timing, but they were incorrect in predicting that Jesus would come back on that day. There was an event that took place, but it was not here on this earth. It was to be an event that took place in heaven when Christ moved into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary and began to examine the record books of heaven. We call that the investigative judgment, the pre-advent judgment, where Christ looks at the records of those who have professed to be followers of Christ. And so when Jesus did not come in 1844, there was great disappointment in the hearts and minds of those believers. Again, we refer to that day as the great disappointment. People's hearts were, the, 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 the disappointment was, was bitter. It was, it, was, it was so great, it just weighed upon them. You know, people made fun of them, of course, as you can imagine. People mocked them and scorned them and criticized them. It was a very difficult, difficult time. Things haven't really changed too much because, you know, when you talk about the second coming of Jesus, and you can't fault them for 
trying to warn the world that Jesus was coming. I mean, look, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus promised to return, and there were an awful lot of Christians before them who said that Jesus was coming as well. But it was a very difficult time, and as they tried to sort through it all, they came to a, a passage in the book of Revelation that they thought really described the experience that they had gone through. And so I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 10. In Revelation chapter 10, we have the story of the mighty angel with the little scroll or the little book. It says there in Revelation 10, beginning at verse 1. Now this is, as you know, this is John, John the disciple. He is an old man. He is a prisoner sent to the Isle of Patmos, a rock in the ocean there. Because of his faith in God and God's word. And while he is there and, and as a prisoner, Jesus comes to him. As Jesus so often does in our difficult times, he comes close and he gives John this vision. John says, I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. This is a message from God. It's not just some fanciful tale that, that John decides to, to spin and write in this book but it is a message that comes from the very throne of God. It's an important message. It's something that God wants us to understand. So the angel comes down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand. We believe that this little book that he had in his hand was what book? Who can, who can help me out? What's this little book that he's holding in his hand? The book of Daniel, right? The book of Daniel. And he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, indicating that this message he was about to share was to cover the entire earth, land and sea, every tribe, tongue, and people. This was something that was not just for a select few, but it was for everybody. Aren't you glad for that? The message of salvation is for everyone. And then it says, he cried with a loud voice. Again, he doesn't cry with a whimper or with a whisper. This is an important message. He cries with a loud voice. And then just to add emphasis, it says, as when a lion roars. Now, I, uh, I've never been close up to a lion except at a zoo where there's a big, thick, plate of glass between us. I don't think I would ever want to be out in the open in front of an, a lion. Sometimes on Friday nights, you know, our family, we, we gather around as we welcome in the Sabbath and we'll, maybe some of you do this too, we, we turn on these nature films, you know. We, we, we look at the nature films because we're reminded, you know, God is the creator and his fingerprints are all around us in creation. And they show some of these lions in these films. I would never want to be out in the open with a lion. But this message, you know, lions are powerful, powerful. And sometimes they just let out a little grunt and they say you can hear it for miles. But this lion is roaring, right? And when he cries out, seven thunders, it says, uttered their voices. Now there's no real explanation here about these thunders, but he goes on to say, now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which, are, uh, which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. It's very much like the book of Daniel, you know, in Daniel where God told him to seal up the book until the time of the end, right? Well, then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea, verse 5, and on the land, raised up his hand to heaven. He's about to make an oath. He's reaching up to heaven. This is serious, serious, an oath. He raises up his arm to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it. And that pretty much covers everything. The heavens, the sea, and the earth. God wants everyone to hear this. And he says this, that there should be delay no longer. Now, as I was preparing for this sermon, I was reading what some different commentaries say about this phrase, there should be delay no longer. 
And there are some who say that this is not the best translation of this verse. The word that's found there is chronos, which means time, chronology. We get the word from, we get chronology from the word chronos, the study of time. And so some have suggested, and I agree with them, that this phrase should, would be better translated this way. Time shall be no more. That time shall be no more. Now, when Miller and the Millerites and others read the 2300-year prophecy and they believed that Jesus was coming, now pay close attention to this, they believed that literal time was coming to an end. That's how they read that. They believed that, that the world as we know it, the history of the world was going to come to an end and Jesus was going to come, but they were wrong. It was not literal time that was coming to an end, but it was prophetic time that was coming to an end. The 2300 day year prophecy, which they had calculated precisely and correctly, was coming to an end. This would be the last time prophecy. No more prophecies dealing with time would follow after this. No more predicting the dates when Jesus would come again. No more. This would be the last one. And so the story goes on. In the days, but in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, as he declared to his servants the prophets. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book, this book of Daniel, which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and I said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it. Take and eat it. Now, obviously, the angel wasn't telling him to, you know, literally, wouldn't you think it's strange if I took this piece of paper and started shoving it into my mouth and eating it? That's not what the angel obviously was asking him to do. When the angel was saying, eat the book, he was saying, study it, read it, take it into your heart and into your mind and embrace it and understand it and follow it. And so they did. Those Millerites, those Christians looking for the coming of Christ. But notice what happens next. And it is this, this the next part of this verse that unlocks the answer as to why the Seventh-day Adventist Church has grown as in the way that it has over these last several hundred years. And by the way, before I, before I say this, I want to remind you that in 1844, the Seventh-day Adventist Church did not exist. You know that, right? There were not Seventh-day Adventists in 1844. They hadn't discovered the Sabbath yet. There were, there were people that were called Millerites because they heard the preaching of William Miller. They were called Millerites. Then they started to call them Adventists because they were looking for the Advent, the second Advent of Christ. And then eventually, without going into a lot of detail, they eventually became known as Seventh-day Adventists. The ones, that, the ones that continued to stay faithful and study and stayed with God after the disappointment, many of them, not all of them, but some of them, became Seventh-day Adventists. And who can tell me in what year the Seventh-day Adventist Church officially organized? Somebody said it. 1863. And I can tell you that 1863, I can tell you without even thinking about it, it was 160 years ago. You know why I know that? Because I was born in 1963. And I'm 60 years old. So from 1863 to 1963 is 100 years, and another 60 makes 160. Well, anyways. My birthday's in January, by the way. <laughs> January 6th. <laughs> so anyway, here we are, right? Revelation 10, verse 9. Here's the answer to why we have grown the way we have grown. Here it is. Take the book and eat it, and here's what it's going to do. It's going to make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. It'll, it'll, go, it'll taste really good, but then it will make your stomach bitter. What is, this, what is this talking about? Well, here's what it's talking about. 
back in the 1800s when all these people were studying these prophecies and they were looking forward to the coming of Christ, it was the sweetest experience they had ever had. If you go back and you read in the writings of some of these early pioneers, they will say things such as this, those years leading up to 1844 were some of the best years of our experience. They were filled with joy. They were filled with happiness. They were, I mean, they were mending fences with, with others that they had problems with. They were asking forgiveness. They were building relationships. They were settling their debts. They were, I mean, it was a joyful, happy time. They were looking for the coming of Christ. It was sweet, sweet to them. Now, let me ask you, when you think of the coming of Christ, is it sweet to you today? Is it really? Do you really long for the coming of Christ today? When you think of the coming of Christ, does it fill your heart with joy? Do you long for Christ to come back? That's what it was like for those people. But when Jesus did not come back, that sweetness became bitter in their belly. There was a terrible discouragement, a terrible disappointment. But as those, those believers read this passage in chapter 2, 10 of Revelation, suddenly they saw themselves and their experience played out in this chapter. They recognized that. And then notice what happens. Here we go. Then, I, then it says, um, I took the little book out of the angel's hand. I ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And verse 11, here it is. This is why we have grown the way we have. He said to me, you must stop prophesying. Is that what it says? You must give up this foolish idea that Jesus is coming back again. You must throw away this idea that you were correct with the 2300 day year prophecy. You must forget all that nonsense. Is that what he said? Absolutely not. He says to them, you must prophesy again. You must not lose hope. You must not give up. You must continue in the face of opposition, in the face of mockery, in the face of discouragement. You must prophesy again and tell the world that Jesus is indeed coming back. Amen. And you are not to just tell a select few, but you are to take it to many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. And aren't you glad today? that the message of salvation is not just for a select few, but it's for every man, woman, and child that lives upon this planet. I'm glad today. I'm glad today that the founders of this great movement saw themselves in this passage. They saw the, the sweetness of their hope in the coming of Christ. They saw that turn to bitterness and sorrow when Jesus did not come back. And yet they heard the call of God saying, you must continue to tell the world. What a great, what a marvelous thing. Now, the book of Revelation is a fascinating book. And, you know, you can read in several places references about the second coming. I'm not going to look at all of them, but I want to look at some of them with you this morning. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, John, as I said earlier, was a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos. And a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos, and, and in verse 7, it says here, Behold, he, that is Jesus, is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. I got to tell you, if you have to hear about the second coming on some feed on your phone or your computer, guess what? That's not the second coming. If you have to hear about the second coming on CNN or Fox or some other newscast or some radio, guess what? That's not the second coming. In fact, I'll even go so far as to say this. If you hear people on these news stations saying that Jesus has returned, it's a false Christ. Because when Jesus comes back, everybody's going to see him. You're not going to have to depend on the news reporters. You are going to see him, whether you're living in Centerville, Ohio, or Chicago, or New York, or Tokyo, or Moscow, or South America, or the North Pole, or Greenland. No matter where you are, if you are alive, and even if you aren't alive, if you're asleep in the grave, you'll wake up and come up out of the grave. You will see Jesus when he comes. He comes with the clouds, and every eye will see him. There's nothing secret. There's not some ethereal coming, you know, some quiet 
thing where some people are going to be snatched away and, and everyone else is going to be wondering what happened. It's not going to be like that. Everybody is going to know. Even those who pierced him. Now what? Even them that pierced him, it appears from that statement that there's going to be some kind of special resurrection where those who, of, the, of those who were involved in his mock trial, those who spit upon him, those who whipped him, those who punched him, who pulled his, his beard from his face, those who mocked him on the cross, they are going to rise. And why not? Jesus told them in the Gospel of Matthew. He said to them, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man come with power and glory in the clouds of heaven. He told them that. And so they see him. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. You know, there are going to be two groups when Jesus comes back. It's just like back in the days of Noah. There are only two groups. You were either in the ark or you were out of the ark. When Christ comes back again, there's only two groups. We're either going to rise up to meet him in the clouds of glory or we're going to run and cry for the rocks and mountains to cover on us. That's the choice that we must make today. Isn't it a strange, you know, we're going to look here at Revelation. Let's go to it right now, Revelation 6. It's a very strange thing to see people running away from Jesus Christ, the giver of life, the creator, the one who loves them and restores them, but they're running away from him. It's a very strange thing. Strange thing. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, the rich men, and the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. Strange. Bizarre, if you really stop to think about it. Why would someone run away from someone as lovely as Christ? They'll run on that day because they've been running, they're running now, away. We don't have to be in that group. Because Isaiah tells us there's another group that looks up to heaven and says, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. That's the group I want to be in. What about you? So these, these ones cry to the, to, to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand. Well, let's take a look here at another, another passage. This one is found, this one is found in uh, Revelation chapter 11. The seventh trumpet sounds, the kingdom is proclaimed. The seventh angel so, uh, sounds, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. Christ is coming again. Do you believe it? Are you looking forward to it? Do you long for it? Are you telling others? Christ is coming back again. And then a, a very familiar passage, but before I read it, this is in Revelation chapter 14, but before I read this, I want to share an interesting statement. This was a statement made by the great evangelist D.L. Moody back in the 1800s, a long time ago. But you know, back, back in those days, you got to remember you know, when Miller and others were telling the world that, that Jesus is coming back, there were preachers that would invite them to come to their churches. You know why? They wanted Miller to come and preach at their churches because they knew that when William Miller came, great crowds would come to hear him. And people would be converted to Christ. But that was as far as they wanted to go. They really did not want to hear that Jesus was coming back again. 
because they believed in this thousand year period, this utopian period where the world would get better and better and better. They did not really want to hear that Jesus was coming back. And that's why when some of these same people that filled their churches held on to this teaching, they were kicked out of their churches. Kicked out of their churches because they believed and they longed for the return of Christ. Listen to what Moody said. To my mind, this precious doctrine, for such I must call it, of the return of the Lord to this earth is taught in the New Testament as clearly as any other doctrine in it. And he goes on to talk about how he never really, he didn't hear much about the second coming from the pulpits in his time. And, you know, we could say that true, that's true of North America too, all the way up probably uh, until through the 50s and 60s until the evangelical world took hold of this idea of the rapture. Now, it, now there are a lot of people that are talking about the second coming, but for years you never heard sermons about the second coming. People didn't want to hear it. And, he, and here's, what, here's what Moody says, the devil does not want us. He does not want us to see this truth, for nothing would wake up the church so much. The moment a man woman, a child, whatever the case may be, takes hold of the truth that Jesus Christ is coming back again to receive his followers to himself, this world loses its hold upon them. Amen. Suddenly, the things that seem so important to us in this world lose their hold, their fascination. They lose their appeal because we recognize that the only thing that really matters is being ready to meet Christ, our eternal friend, and spending eternity with him. Amen. Especially when you stop to consider all that he has given in order to save us. This person who takes hold of this teaching, their heart is free. And he looks for the blessed appearing of his Lord who at his coming will take him into his blessed kingdom. Do you know that the only hope for this world is the second coming of Jesus? Now I want to say something at the risk of being misunderstood. I believe that as Christians we should do everything in our power. We should use all of our energy, we should, we should, we should use our energy to the best of our abilities. We should use our resources to help other people, to relieve suffering in the world, to help find answers and solutions to the problems that we face. But think about this for just a minute. In the history of this world, we have, we have thrown, just take the history of this country, we have thrown billions and billions of dollars at the problems of our culture and our society. And guess what? The problems are still here. So again, hear me out. We should do everything we can. We must. We're Christians. We're called to, to serve and to help. But let's never forget that none of those things are ever going to really ultimately solve the problems of this world. It's like strapping a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. The only hope that you and I have, the only hope that this world has, the only solution for the problems of this world is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's it. So in Revelation chapter 14, we have the three angels' message, the last message that goes to the ends of the earth. And, uh, you know, we have uh, the, the message is founded on the everlasting gospel. It goes to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. It's a call to judgment. It's a call to the investigative judgment taking place in heaven. It's warning the world that the judgment has begun. It's a message that calls people back to worshiping the Creator and keeping the seventh-day Sabbath. It is a message that calls people to come out of Babylon and the religious confusion of this day. It is a message that warns people against worshiping the beast and the image of the beast and receiving a mark in their forehead and in their hand. And then it describes something quite amazing to me in verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. You see the two groups. It's always amazed me, since I've become a Christian, to hear Christians, honest-hearted, sincere Christians, who will say, because we're saved by grace, we don't need to worry about the Ten Commandments of God. 
Certainly we know the commandments do not save us. But a person who is truly converted will keep the commandments. And it says very clearly here, God's people living at the very end of time on the very threshold of the coming of Christ are described as saints who keep the commandments of God. Could it be any clearer than that? The commandments are important. Not as a means of salvation do we obey, but as a fruit of our salvation. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Jesus is coming back again. Well, I'm running out of time. I love this topic. I could preach on and on, but I I know you probably are getting tired. So Revelation 22, last one. We could look at Revelation chapter 19. We could look at, uh, you know, but I'm going to skip over those and you you go home and, and... You read about Jesus coming in the clouds on a horse as a mighty conqueror. You know, he came first as a helpless babe and he had a crown of thorns at Calvary. But when Christ comes back again, he'll be coming back as a conquering king with a crown of glory. And here in the the very end of Revelation, you know, in Revelation chapter 1, you have the story of Christ coming in the clouds and every eye sees him. It's like two, it's like bookends on a bookshelf. And here at the very end of Revelation, you have Jesus coming back again in verse 12 of chapter 22, behold, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. And then in verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Even, amen, even so, come Lord Jesus. Christ is coming back. The greatest, most wonderful event that the world will see is the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, I'll tell you, Albert Einstein, on that train, he may not have known where he was going. But I'm here to tell you today that Seventh-day Adventist Christians know. They know where we're going. We're going to heaven. We're going to meet our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us. And soon and very soon, He's going to pierce through. He's going to come down through the Orion and through the clouds of heaven. And we're going to look up and we're going to say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. Never stop believing this. Never give up. Never lose hope. Keep your hearts focused. Jesus is coming. I know that you've heard most everything I've said here. Most of you have heard all this before. But it needs to be repeated again and again and again. Because even for the strongest Christian, the weight starts to weary us and sometimes doubt can creep in. We need to be reminded frequently This is a true teaching. We have not believed in cunningly devised fables. Jesus Christ will come back again. Why? Because he has promised he would come. And not one of his promises will ever, ever fail. Now, we're going to sing a beautiful hymn as we close our service here today. How sweet are the tidings. But before we uh, sing, I want to tell you the deacons are going to come and collect an offering. So what I'm going to ask you to do is just remain seated as we begin the song. Sing the first few stanzas while you're seated. The deacons will collect the offering. And then at the appropriate time, our worship team will invite you to stand.
Christ, Heavenly Father, thank you for the sure and certain promise of the return of Jesus Christ. We look at the world around us, we see all the sorrow, the heartache, the sickness, the strife, the death. All of that will be swept away forever and for eternity. Help us, Lord, to stay faithful. Help us not to lose hope. Help us to do what that angel said so long ago, to go out and proclaim this message again and again to all the people that we can so that others can be ready as well. We look forward, Lord, to your return, and we say in the words of John there in Revelation, amen, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.